Are, are you ready for, uh, you know, the, the holidays coming up? I, I, I think this season ought to be known as, like, it's seasonal whiplash season, right? You, you go into a store and you can buy uh, Halloween candy right next to the Thanksgiving stuffing mix, right next to the Christmas ornaments. It's all ready right there at your disposal. Uh, I, know, I know some of you are getting ready for Christmas already. You're, you're listening to Christmas music. I've seen some of you post the schedule for the uh, Hallmark Christmas movies coming out this year, starting like next week or something. You know, they'll, they'll start Christmas movies, and some of you are ready for that. And I, I find that schedule just sort of pointless. You know, they're on all the time, and they're all the same movie. There's literally no reason for you to have a schedule. You can find the same stuff anytime you want. But some of us are getting ready for Christmas. I have to confess, I, I've got to admit, Sherry and I were walking through the store the other day, and, and it was a store, you know, in the middle of the aisle, they had all this uh, junk on, on clearance in the middle of the aisle, and I passed by something, and I thought, oh, our, our daughter Zoe would really like that. And I, I'm going to buy that for her stocking for Christmas. And so I grabbed this, and then I asked Sherry the, the most important question as we purchase this item for a stocking for Christmas, do you think we'll remember that I bought this in September for Christmas? Not a very good chance. We, you, there are some things, though, we, we need to get ready for. When I was a student pastor in, in Yuma, I was working at a church in Yuma, Arizona. We, we took a mission trip every uh, year to uh, Mexico to build a house. And so one of the things we would do to prepare for this mission trip is we would get out all the equipment that the church owned. You know, the, we had tents, and we had camping equipment, and we had uh, just different items that we used every year on this, on this mission trip trip, and so we would get those items out, and we would inventory them. And then one, one specific day, we would get the team together, the students and adults who were going on this mission trip, and we would practice putting up the tents. We camped out, and so we would practice putting up the tents just in case you, you got to the campsite later than you thought, and it was dark, or it was raining, or any number of things could happen when you arrive at the campsite. You, you, sometimes you don't want to be uh, discussed discovering for the first time whether or not you have all the poles and whether or not you can put the tent together uh, uh, at the campsite. And so we, we would do everything we could to uh, get ready. One year it just rained and rained. It was a torrential storm and, and we discovered that one of the things we ought to do to prepare for this mission trip is to check the tents for, you know, being sealed for any leaks because everybody's stuff just got soaked. And, and so a youth coach and I went into Tijuana with all these soaked sleeping bags, and we discovered that we were not prepared to negotiate in a Tijuana laundromat for the price of, you know, washing and drying these, these items, some things you can't prepare for. You want to be uh, prepared. Uh, some experts say, you know, the real trick to being ready for something that you can't really be ready for is sometimes just to get started, just to begin. And uh, there's a billionaire now, Richard Branson, who started an airline once upon a time. He told this story about how he started this airline. He was, he was set to go on vacation to the Virgin Islands, and, and he really he had planned this trip. He was excited about this trip. He was ready to go, and uh, they canceled the last flight out of the airport for his vacation. But he was determined to make it to his destination on time, and so he chartered a plane to take him to the Virgin Islands. This is before before he was uh, as wealthy as he is today, and he said, he, I didn't have money to charter the plane. I couldn't pay the price of the chartered aircraft, but I chartered the plane, and he wrote out a sign that said Virgin uh, Airlines, and then he sold passage to the folks that were planning to make that trip, you know, on the, on the, on the flight that had just been canceled. He sold tickets for $29 uh, in order to pay for the chartered airplane, which maybe dates when he started that airline, right? $29 uh, to pay for this chartered aircraft. Uh, but some experts say that the trick to being ready for stuff that we think we can't ever really be ready for is just to get 
started. We want to be ready for the most important things in our life, the big events in our life, and certainly as we read through the book of Revelation, we know that we, we must be ready for the return of Christ. I think that Revela- Revelation chapter 15 and 16 uh, highlight for us three scenes that help us prepare for Jesus' return. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to Revelation chapter 15 and 16. We're going to take a look at these three scenes that prepare us for the return of Christ. Help us to be ready for Jesus' return. Revelation chapter 15 and 16, we're going to take a look at these three scenes. We'll read the scripture as we work our way through uh, these three scenes. The scene number one is uh, one more peek into heaven. We, we get this one more glimpse into uh, the throne room of God. It, it's depicted in a little different way here in Revelation chapter 15. Eight verses make up chapter 15, but uh, it, it, we're back in the throne room that we've, uh, we've been in the presence of God before in Revelation. This is what God's Word says. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of of God in their hands. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for you are, your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. A a dramatic scene. And really that's how John begins his description. He says, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. I suppose you go back to chapter 12 when when John has said for the last time before this, hey, there's this amazing sign, you have to check it out, and it was the woman and the dragon, and and we talked about all that that encompassed, and over and over in the book of Revelation, we've just been struck by one dramatic scene after another, by one one amazing depiction of of a beast or a sign in the heavens or or whatever it is, and there's so much that you can sort of get lost in it all. You can sort of get to a point where you just, I just, I, I need to get through this. I'm just sort of numb to this. And I would just, I would just ask you, take your time as you study this book and just pay attention, pay attention to all that it has to offer. I read an article this week about NASA delaying the launch of the Artemis rocket. Some of you maybe are aware of this. I was not especially aware that they had a rocket to launch that they were delaying. But I read this article, and it's about the plans for NASA to go back to the moon. Uh, to, to go to the moon and beyond, really, but, but plans to go back to the moon. And I thought, you know, how was I not more in tune to this notion that the United States, that NASA, we're, we're heading back to the moon. We, we've got to get there. And why, why haven't I been paying attention to this? And I just looked up the, the numbers of television viewership for those first steps on the moon in 1969. 350 million people worldwide watched those first steps on the moon. To put that in perspective, that's the, that's the total of the last six Super Bowl television viewerships combined. Everybody around the world paid attention to this, paid attention to this dramatic thing that was happening. And, and now we're sort of, man, there's so many other things going on. There, there's so much attention paid to all sorts of different events and decisions and votes and, and political discussions that, that maybe we, we stop being fascinated by things that ought to fascinate us. And I suppose that same truth could apply to our study of Revelation, but it's worth slowing down. And it's worth taking a look at one more series 
of sevens. We, we've, we've studied the, the seven seals and the seven trumpets. And now here in, in, in we're, we're introduced to these seven angels with seven plagues. And they're going to carry out of this tabernacle in heaven these seven bowls. Which are the last, John describes in verse 1. For with them the wrath of God is finished. It's interesting, these series of sevens. I, I just want to talk about a few different ways that folks view these seven uh, seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. One way you can study this and understand what John is saying is, is that it's all happening chronologically. That it's a, there's a progression from those seven seals, that's going to happen. And then the seven trumpets will happen. And then the seven bowls will happen. And then Jesus will return. So it, it could happen and all in in progression here. Uh, Another way that scholars look at these uh, series of sevens is is sort of parallel, that they're all going on at the same time. We're introduced to them with the the first advent, with Jesus entering the world, his death and resurrection, and we've sort of been living through these series of seven, and we will until Jesus returns. That's mostly how we've discussed these series of sevens here in our study of Revelation. There's one last look I want us to pay attention to. And this, this sort of, this is maybe cheats, right? It combines these two ideas. And, and, and certainly, I, I think this is at least valuable to consider because there does seem to be this progression. We're going to see... Uh, These seven bowls are awfully similar to the seven trumpets we studied in Revelation chapter 8 and 9, right? They sound very much the same. They look very much the same. There's different imagery used, bowls instead of trumpets. But the events, the happenings, look very much the same with with just a couple of major differences, And so some people say, well, these last two uh, series of sevens sort of happen in the the tail end of the first series of seven with the seven seals. They they say this mostly because if you remember those first four writers in Revelation chapter 6, right, the the seven seals, I think it's chapter 6, and and you get uh, the writers representing things like war and bloodshed and famine and disease and death. And so these, these happenings that occur and certainly have happened throughout this church age, throughout this history between Jesus' first advent and when he returns. And, and so they say, okay, but it seems to progress somehow. And, and, uh, and eventually we get this language that God's wrath is going to be finished. He continues in verse 2 to say, and I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. This is the first hint that we're back in the throne room of God. We encountered this this sea of crystal in Revelation chapter 4 and and we sort of uh, talked about how it it stood up against the the sea in in the world. The the sea in heaven was, was clear. It was crystal you could see and and the sea on on the world is dark and and there's you know people in in the first century were unsure of what was happening beneath the water and so it represented chaos and and pain and suffering and 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 evil even and and we recognize that the sea in heaven is clear that that while there still seems to be the, some kind of separation between God and and people that that God can settle the storm, the, the chaos of the world, that he, he brings peace. And, and here that, that clear crystal sea is mixed with fire because God's judgment is on the way. And yet we're reminded right away in verse 2 that there are those who have been sealed by the Spirit. There, there are those with, with the name of God on their forehead and, and hands that are standing beside the sea with, with harps of, of God singing praises to him. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been 
revealed. They, they sing this song that was used as a hymn of, of worship and praise in the early church. They, you can write down Exodus chapter 15. It, it's very similar to a song that Moses used to celebrate God, to worship him as he led his people out of captivity in Egypt. And here again, we're reminded that God is still rescuing his people, that God is still about calling his people into relationship with him and, and saving them, leading them out of their captivity to sin. After this, I looked in verse 5, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. That imagery of the Exodus continues. We, we get this picture of, of this, this tent of meeting, this tabernacle that seems to be in heaven at this point. And out of, that, out of that sanctuary, out of that tabernacle, come these seven angels. They're dressed like priests, and they're carrying these bowls full of the wrath of God. These bowls are interesting. They, they sort of, you know, we don't use bowls in the way that the, the priests in the Old Testament would have used them. First, they use these bowls to drink wine. We're going to get that imagery at the end of chapter 16 when the city drinks of the, the wrath of God. And so they, they use these bowls to drink wine. But secondly, my, my favorite image of, of these angels carrying these, these bowls was that priests would, would be responsible for the sacrifices, obviously, these burnt offerings to God, and then they would use bowls to clean up after the offerings. And so they would carry out ashes in sort of these ceremonial burnt ends, you know, the leftovers of these uh, sacrifices. They would carry them out of, of the, the temple and the, the place of worship. And so we, we get this imagery of those angels carrying the, the wrath of God the, uh, away to the people of the world. Verse 8, and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And so this, this imagery of the smoke, and it again, goes back to the Exodus, a pillar of smoke leading the people. God, in his glory, there'd be this cloud, and, and the point here is that God is present. And that he's making a way for his people to be in the presence of of him forever and ever and ever. Before that, this wrath has to be poured out, though. You might go through chapters 15 and 16 and just underline uh, phrases like, it is finished or it's done, and just how many times that's emphasized in these couple of chapters. There's, there comes a point when God's wrath is finished, and that, that, that's important for a couple of reasons. And, and the most important reason for us is that there's, there's a, a period in time, however long it is, that we have the opportunity to say yes to him. And then that period comes to an end. And, and if we're outside of a relationship with Jesus, then this wrath that we're talking about is, is ours to experience. That we're not marked by him, that we're not sealed by his spirit, that we're not in relationship with him. I understand that studying Revelation can be frustrating in this regard. I, you know, I watch all kinds of sports. My, one of my least favorite sports, though, is soccer. And soccer irritates me for, for many, uh, for several reasons, not many. But uh, one of the reasons is, is that, you know, you, you're never really sure when the game is over. Right? When this match on the pitch in your kit is finally completed. Uh, you know, the, the, the whistle will blow and you think the game is over. And then the referee says, oh, no, 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 no. There's extra time. I'm like, what do you mean extra time? Well, you've watched soccer matches and you see that they, you know, they'll fall down and writhe around in pain and then get up and run for an hour and a half more. And, and you, they add up some of that, that time that's wasted with these, this sort of thing, and, and uh, then they have extra time. That's exactly how it works, right? I mean, that's, that's it. You get this extra time, and it's just, just sort of frustrating. You know, when is this game really over? And I understand that as you study through Revelation, there's all these timing statements, and, and here we get in chapter 15 and 16, it's finished, it's done, it's over. The only trouble is there's, you, you know, 
chapters 18, 19, and 20, 21, to get till we're done with the book. We have this time when we have the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And at some point, that time runs out. That time is finished. Here we get one more look into the uh, throne room of God, one more look into heaven. Uh, scene number two is that we get one more look at God's judgment. Let's take a look at, at the first 16 verses here in chapter 16 as we consider this, this last look at, at his judgment, at least at this point. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. We get, have these series of sevens, and, and we're, we're going to read about these seven bowls. And, and uh, one thing that, that I want to mention is that these seven bowls look very similar to the seven trumpets. There, there's only a couple of differences, and, and we're going to talk about that as we go. Let's, let's get to this first bowl. Verse 2 says, So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and the harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And so we find out who's, who's dealing with this torment and pain. It's those marked by the beast. Uh, again, these, these bowls look like the plagues in Egypt. If you, if you read about this plague in, in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 11, you'll read about the magicians. These, are, these were the guys, if you remember the story, you know, Moses would do a miracle, would perform a miracle, and then the magicians would perform a, a, a trick that appeared to be that miracle that looked the same. And, and you get to this point where uh, these sores are afflicted on the magicians, and Exodus chapter 9 says that they were unable to stand any longer, that ultimately God is going to win out here, and his judgment will prevail. Verse 3 says, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers in the springs of water, and they became blood. Uh, this looks an awful lot like the second and third trumpet in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and following. And the real difference here is that in Revelation chapter 8, if you remember, the, a third of the waters turned to blood, and a third of the living creatures died. And here you, you don't have a percentage, do you, that all the water is judged and all the living creatures in the sea die that God's judgment is complete and full and final here in chapter 16 and I heard in verse 5 the angel in charge of the waters say just are you O holy one who is and who was for you brought these judgments for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. We get sort of this interlude here with a couple of verses that just reassure us that God is in charge and his, his judgments are just, that this ought to be happening. Because you know, I don't think I'm alone that when you read this kind of judgment and you, you, one of the th questions that you, you have to ask is, you know, how can a God who is, who is loving judge in this way? How can these things be true of that, of that perfect loving God? And I love one of the things that a scholar says. He says, all caricatures of God that ignore his intense hatred of sin reveal more about human nature than God. I think one of the troubles we have when we read about God's judgment is, is this realization that every one of us deserves his judgment, that every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God, and outside a relationship with Jesus, this is our just end. Verse 8 goes on to say, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores. They did not repent of their deeds." We talked when we studied those uh, seven trumpets, we, I, I mentioned that I think those seven trumpets illustrate and they represent, you know, kind of the spiritual warfare aspect of God's judgment. 
And I, I think here in these couple of verses, we get the fullness, the completeness of that. It, it, I just uh, put a box around the phrase, scorch people with fire and plunged into darkness. And I thought, where have I heard those descriptions before in the New Testament? And you read about that kind of description with fire and darkness and separation when you study hell and this final completeness of God's wrath poured out an eternal separation from him. It's similar to Revelation chapter 14 verses 10 through 11 that we talked about in terms of that final separation, that uh, condemnation to, to eternal punishment in hell. Verse 12 says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they, they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. This day of judgment is on its way. And, and the, this unholy trinity of, of, of the beast and the dragon and, and the false prophet will all meet this doom of, of, of God's judgment. And, and they're just trying to drag as many people with them as they can. I, I just wrote at the end of chapter 16, you know, none of this is any good. And none of this judgment is, is pleasant to read or to think about. But, but we get verse 15 in the middle of all of this. And as I, I prepared this message, I thought, you know, verse 15 seems to sort of be hidden here. But it's not really. It's just in the middle of it. And I think be, that's because verse 15 is, is the theme of Revelation. It's the point of Revelation. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Jesus is coming again. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Be ready for Jesus' return. Hey, we're told to stay awake. To, to study his word, to be aware. The enemy's prowling around like a lion. You, you know, keep your eyes open. Stay awake to, to keep your garments on. That's not just good advice in church. It's, it's the idea is that keep your work clothes on. You're on mission. You, you are the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. Why? Because we know Jesus. The one thing, the one person, the one God who can unite all of us, who, who can make a way for all of us to be in that throne room. To, when the, the smoke clears, and those first few verses talk about that we can be in the presence of God, is Jesus. He is the hope of the world. Stay on mission with him. Hold on to him a little longer so that you won't be embarrassed, naked and exposed when he returns. And it's the theme, it's the point, it's the message of revelation. And I, I know, I understand there's so many things that we can be distracted by. In fact, verse 16, I think it's one of them. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. We talked about the mark of the beast in this number 666. And, you know, we sort of discussed all the different things that, not all of them, but we mentioned some of the different things that people maybe think this mark will be or what it will look like or, or what we're supposed to know about the number 666. And there's all these different opinions. And as long as that list is, there's probably a longer list about about opinions about this battle of Armageddon. It's a word that, that is a, a, a reference to a place. Most scholars think it's a reference to Megiddo, which is a, a famous battlefield. You can go study it and you'll, you'll learn about 34 battles throughout history that we know of anyway that took place in this location. A dozen of those happened during you know, biblical times. And so as John wrote this in the first century, this was a, a famous battlefield. And so scholars point to this specific location that this battle will take place. The only problem with that is that, uh, you know, when you study Megiddo, you're going to study these plains of Megiddo, and there's no mountains there. Well, the first part of this word Armageddon in Hebrew means mountain. And so if we have to come down with a geographic location for this battle, I think we're probably talking about Jerusalem. And it, but, but, 
this imagery, like much of the imagery in Revelation, ought to be weighed instead of counted. You know, you, you, sometimes we look at these years and time frames, and even the, 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 the seven trumpets and seven bulls and seven seals, and what we ought to be doing is weighing them. What's the, why is John talking about this in, in, in this way? And, and here it's this battle, this confrontation between God and the world, between light and dark, between good and evil, between God and this unholy trinity. We get this one last look at God's judgment here in Revelation chapter 16. Finally, scene number three is one more look. One more look at the end. Let's just take a look at the last few verses here in chapter 16. There's not a lot that I want to unpack here. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. Uh, Again, go back and underline and just think about the different phrases of it is done or it is finished in these couple of chapters. And there were flashes of lightning and rumbling peals of thunder and the great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. We've been here before, haven't we? We've had the the lightning and the thunder and the earthquake. We are at the end one more time. Verse 19, the great city was split into three parts. That's just complete destruction. And the cities of the nation fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of wine, a fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. This is God's complete and final judgment. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed God for the plague of the hell, because the plague was so severe. Again, we get this, this imagery of, of folks unable or unwilling to repent that this is God's final wrath being poured out. We get one more look at the end, at God's final uh, judgment here in Revelation chapter 16. I was serving as a youth pastor in New Arizona, and I'm, I'm old because I was serving uh, in 1999. And some of you will remember that as the year turned to to the year 2000, there was all this discussion about Y2K, all this concern about computers who, you know, ran with this, this time marker of the last two numbers of the 1900s, so 1999, then it would go to the year 2000, there'd be two zeros, and computers would think that it was 1900, and chaos would ensue. All right, that's a very simple version, because I'm not smart enough to give a more complex version But folks were very worried that uh, shipments would not uh, happen and that planes would fall from the sky and that, you know, you wouldn't be able, there would be no food in the grocery stores and and it it was just going to be chaos, even to the point where people were prepping, were preparing for this. I, I served with a, with a pastor on staff there at Yuma who was very concerned about this, and he thought, you know, we need to position ourselves as a church in Yuma to be a light in this darkness that was coming. And so he wanted, you know, he, he did all the research, and he said, we need to be prepared to, to feed people when there's no food available, and a couple things here. Yuma is like the agricultural capital of the United States. Like all your vegetables that you eat, you know, the lettuce and the, that, it's grown in Yuma. There's literally fields and fields of food in the backyard of Yuma. But number two, his plan for having meals ready for the community was to buy this pallet of military meals ready to eat. And so he negotiated and bought this pallet, and I don't remember now how many meals were on this pallet. There, I want to say there were 1,500 meals. Maybe it was many more than that. Let's say there were 5,000 meals. And through the course of this discussion, I realized, I don't really, if the world is coming to an end and there's chaos and planes are falling from the sky and nobody has any food available, how are we to determine... Which one of the hundreds of thousands of people in Yuma, Arizona would get these 5,000 meals that only our church had? I thought this is like potentially zombie apocalypse sort of thing happening, storming our church gymnasium for these MREs, which nobody would ever do. If you've ever eaten an MRE, you know why. 
maybe, maybe we weren't as prepared as we thought we were. You know, just get started in being prepared. The, the message of Revelation is be prepared for Jesus' return. There is a simple choice you can make to get started to be prepared for his return. And it's just to say yes to him. If you've yet for the first time to say yes to Jesus, make today the day. Talk to somebody you see on stage. Mark baptism on that welcome home card. We want to talk to you about how you can take that first step to say yes to him. Let's stand and worship him right now.